So here's the social justice connection to Vancouver and to mining. This industry has a really bad track record. Not just in the past, I mean right now, by some of the more prominent mining companies headquartered here in Vancouver. Uh, some human rights abuses of intimidating and even ordering the killing of protesters, like happened last year in Guatemala, um, of hiring paramilitaries or mercenaries to stop indigenous and non-indigenous communities' challenges to their proposed projects. So not only that, but these companies now have a federal government of Canada working on their behalf. Our politicians and diplomats, even our current and past prime ministers, are lobbying foreign governments on behalf of the extractive companies' private interests. They're bullying other countries with economic sanctions and diplomatic pressures to ensure that these Canadian companies get the mining concessions they want and mining in tax codes written in their favor. The Canadian government is not only condoning the wholesale transfer of costs from companies to marginalized communities uh, in resource-rich countries, but they're also normalizing it, they're legitimizing it, and pushing the countries to accept laws that enable these predatory practices in other countries. And that's pretty unethical. Now, here's the closest connection to us in this room. So right now, we've been made directly complicit. UBC, NSFU, and Ecole Polytechnique in Montreal are now hosting a new Extractive Industry and Development Institute uh, with the acronym CIIEID, using academia to help support the governance ideologies and policies of Canada to foreign governments. Not just on any foreign governments either, but on the governments of resource-rich countries where Canadian mining, oil, and gas companies have significant commercial interests and investments. So, a little background on this, on this institute. It started with a $25 million chunk of cash from CETA, part of the federal government, and that will last five years, and it's expected to partner with the mining industry to get cash for its operations after that. Uh, in 2012, uh, Julian Fantino said that the Canadian government has a duty and a responsibility to ensure that Canadian interests are promoted. Okay, and he reassured the mining industry that this institute will be their biggest and best ambassador. Uh, that's Canadian tax dollars being used on behalf of the predatory interests of a small group of powerful companies in the private sector. So although the Institute's mandate is said to be to help developing country governments meet their need for policy, legislation, and regulatory development related to their own extractive sector, from his expertise in the subject, Dr. Denon will help us to deconstruct this rhetoric and help us to understand what this is really talking about. So students have been raising some pretty strong critiques about this institute and insisting that our universities shouldn't be taking this legitimizing or enabling role for the predatory mining industry. And journalists are identifying some ethical challenges with it. Uh, public organizations, NGOs, uh, that work with communities affected by mining are publishing some pretty strong statements identifying the institute as a threat and is inherently unable uh, to, to bring good to the vulnerable. This movement to close the Institute has been mushrooming over the last few months, thanks to students making a critical examination of it and taking a stand for social justice. So I recognize that we have a room full of diverse interests and paradigms, value systems and aspirations. Um, Whatever our current occupations are, and whatever our current paradigm, I think that everyone in this room shares one fundamental commitment. The commitment to bring no further harm to the exploited, to the historically marginalized, and in fact, using our privilege and abilities to ally, instead of, instead of uh, 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 or ahead of other economic or consumption-based allegiances, with those made vulnerable, by asymmetric power dynamic that's for a long time been transferring disproportionate wealth to us and disproportionate costs to the marginalized. Uh, so today let's celebrate this common commitment to social justice that we all hold dearly. So as Dr. Deneau speaks, I encourage everyone to engage critically with what he says. Uh, let's not just agree or disagree with him simply because it supports or challenges our own worldviews or paradigms. Uh, 
uh, but rather because of the truth or social validity or lack thereof of what he's saying. So Dr. Alain Deneau is a, is a lecturer of critical thought in the political science department at the University of Montreal. He conducts research for the Quebec section of the Tax Justice Network. He's co-author of the book Noir Canada, and his uh, books recently translated into English include Offshore, Tax Havens, and the Rule of Global Crime, and Paul Martin and Companies, 60 Theses on the Illegal Nature of Tax Havens. Uh, his latest book, Canada, A New Tax Haven, will be released by Talon Books in 2015 in English. Uh, the French language version, I've heard, uh, was released last week, uh, two weeks ago. And in Quebec, there's just been a media flurry around this release. Um, uh, in fact, Dr. Deneau just addressed over a million viewers when he spoke on, on Sunday, was it? Uh, what, was, what was the station, or what was the show? Tout le monde en parle in Radio Canada. A uh, uh, million viewers, the most popular show in Quebec. And people are now engaging more with the issue of, with the issues that Dr. Deneau is a uh, the thesis developed in his book, Imperial Canada Inc., translated to English in 2012, is central to Dr. Deneau's talk today. And that's why I've asked to be able to make this book available for purchase here after the talk. Uh, we're selling it in back. Um, his robust investigation and clear writing is one of the central reasons why we can be informed enough to raise critical questions about how this mining institute at our university uh, uh, is right now. Uh, so his work challenges us to intellectually, uh, challenges us, I'm sorry, intellectually, and is a massive contribution to our national discussion around the meaning and role of the Canadian state. So please welcome our guest, Dr. Alain Denon. Thank you, Samuel, for this uh, generous presentation. I'm pleased to be here. It was said that Canada has no colonial past. Uh, I'm always amused when I hear that because, in, in a sense, it is true Canada has no colonial past because Canada is a colonial past. I mean, we were historically the instrument of the British Empire to allow monopolies to get access to natural resources, regardless of the situation of First Nations. This is our history, and this is. Uh, our, uh, the, the tradition, we're, the political tradition we're in still today. Um, I was trying about half an hour, 40 minutes to answer two questions. What is the role of the Canadian jurisdiction with respect to the world mining industries? And the second question will be, what part plays this Canadian International Institute for Extractive Industries and Development here in Montreal. Um, I started to be interested in the mining, the Canadian mining industries when I was in France. I was working with a, an independent association called Sovi on the relationships between France and its former colonies and the scope of a critic of neo-colonialist relationships between uh, France and, and these, um, these African countries. And uh, while working on these issues with respect to tax havens and all, all sort of questions related to the uh, economic criminality, I bumped into Canadian cases several times. And then I saw that, well, maybe we're not that involved in the Pacific country, this is a model of democracy, these I mean, eternal blue helmets, and whatever we can say about this. And that maybe we, we have more than just bad apples, but a systematic way to support uh, players, especially, especially in the mining sector uh, in the Gulf South. And well, then I started to read some reports that I could uh, see or discover. And I saw that the cases of abuse or crime that were related to the Canadian mining companies were not anecdotal at all. I mean, it was about corruption, bribery, problem related to public health, uh, massive 
solution, uh, arms dealing, uh, mercenaries, uh, partnerships with dictatorships, uh, uh, collusion with warlords, uh, and of course tax avoidance, tax evasion. And it's, it was cases, at, at the beginning I was interested in, in, in Africa, and then I worked with, with William Sasher uh, on the um, cases related to um, South America and Asia and Eastern Europe. And we could see that there was a model uh, involving always the same problems, the same methods uh, about these, uh, these uh, problems of cases of abuse in a lot of countries. And it was in Africa, it was Tanzania, uh, Burkina Faso, Mali. Uh, and then in South, South America, we could see Guatemala, Chile, Argentina, we've been mentioned, and in Indonesia, uh, in, uh, Romania, Greece, and so on and so forth. And there's plenty of reports talking about all these different problems, major problems, like UN reports from experts mandated by the Council of Security, or reports from uh, parliaments like the, the House of Representatives in the US, or the, the, parliament, the UK Parliament, the French Parliament, the Belgian Parliament, the decisions of justice in Spain, uh, reports from parliamentary groups in, in, in Congo, uh, and also all kinds of sources from independent organizations and these international global witness, the Poland Institute Pro, uh, books from specialists uh, of Africa, our documentaries. So at that time, I mean, in the middle of the decade 2000, there were virtually already a black book on the Canadian mining companies in the Global South. We just had to summarize this information, put it together, and analyze what appeared as being a systematic exploitation. And the, 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 the problem, uh, the, the issue was, of course, about what was happening on the ground, but also how the Canadian jurisdiction helped these corporations, these Canadian corporations, to uh, behave as they do uh, in these different countries. I mean, to, to be a bit concrete, I can raise a few examples of what we're talking about when we're talking about cases of abuse in the way I, I, I mentioned them. Uh, for instance, I mean, we have plenty of examples. In Mont Canada is a book that I wrote first, and then it was Imperial Canada Inc. But Mont Canada is a book of 350 pages with more than a thousand footnotes about plenty of cases. Uh, it, it's a series of horrors uh, related to, to this industry. And for instance, in Mali, there was this joint venture called CMOS, S E M O S. It's a joint venture. Uh, between Anglo Gold, uh, South African uh, corporation that made its, uh, it, that, that was uh, important uh, under the apartheid regime, and the Canadian corporation called I Am Gold. Literally, I Am Gold. And when I talk about it, I never know if I must say it is gold or they are gold. Or <laughs> well, they are but I Am Gold. And well, they, I mean, what they, uh, allegedly done in the Mali is just terrible. And if a French woman who made a movie out of it uh, wouldn't have been there, maybe we still wouldn't know about what happened in, in Mali. This Semos Corporation neglect the treatment of uh, toxic waste. They exposed employees to cyanide. They, uh, produce, they exploit the mine in a so active way that in the communities, in the villages, in the cities, there were so many, so, so much dust that people started to be sick. And within the dust, there were small toxic particles that could be uh, breathed. So it, 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 we start to see in the community very important problems related to public health, and employees started to be sick. And when they were sick, they were told by the company to drink milk, to, to, to get the uh, cured. Uh, 
And um, all of a sudden, people saw birds dying, animals dying, and women started to uh, have miscarriage. Uh, so the, the, the filmmaker, Camille de Vitry, started to make a story out of it. And to be able to sue her for defamation, the company asked the Minister of Public Health of Mali to inquire on the question in order to prove that it was false. And well, actually, the, the study showed that four women out of five were having miscarriage because there was arsenic in the only source of drinking water in the area. Uh, in Yatela, for instance, a village where the inquiry uh, happened, there was no children under tree because the mine was in operation since three years. Um, why this, this case is related with another one. Uh, the electricity provided to that joint venture in order to allow it to exploit this open mine pit uh, in Mali. This, the electricity needed for that came from the Senegal River uh, that is in Mauritania, Mali, and uh, Senegal. Two dams, with the support of the Canadian International Development Agency, CEDA, and afterward being convinced by CEDA, by the World Bank and other international uh, financiers, two dams were built in order to provide that electricity to the mine. It's Tiana and Manantali. Specialists of uh, those fields predicted before the project were, was launched in the 1980 that these two dams would be a disaster for the communities. Specialists of Denmark, USA, Switzerland, and of elsewhere. It was a very controversial project. But CEDA supported it very intensively, and effectively, it became a disaster. And water overflowed on arable lands, fishing and breeding became impossible. Uh, we saw thousands of environmental refugees appearing in cities. Civil war in the area uh, uh, appeared because there were no, not much resources as previously. And well, who to benefit from it? Well, Canadian corporations, because essentially, La Fanin, the Sultex, Roche, Sultza, and Hydro Quebec International had huge contracts to build these dams. And these dams provide electricity to the CMOS that exploit that gold in Mali, not with funding, and regardless of the consequences for populations. And on websites, of the Canadian government. We presented these projects as Canadian success uh, abroad. We're very proud to help countries to develop themselves, although this help is provided to Canadian corporations that develop themselves abroad. We could put also the Congolese case. I mean, between 1996 and 2003, there were five million deaths related to a very cruel war in the Great Lake area of Africa. And mainly, according to UN sources and all kinds of sources, I mean, the, 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 the findings uh, were about who controls the, the mining sites, the concessions. And throughout the war, the, war, the wars, in plural, throughout the wars, there were Canadian corporations singing, signing contracts with villagers, with warriors, uh, whether they were on the governmental side or on the rebel side, to have access to the resources. When Laurent Desiré Kabila in 1996, 1997, uh, made his coup against Joseph Mobutu in a crisscross movement to secure all the mining concessions he could find on his way, while Canadian 
mining companies were signing contracts with him before he was even president and were financing his war uh, and uh, choosing him as their president. It started before the war, all this went happened. The story started before the war because before 1986, after the fall of the Berlin War, when the Cold War was over, Joseph Mobutu wasn't as useful to U.S. government, to the Canadian government, to France, to Belgium as he was before, and he started to become politically weak, and that's why he had to uh, give access to the resources of his land he controlled it to at that point, to uh, private companies. So it was clear that Kampu was becoming a huge market, a huge, huge um, a source of or for mining companies uh, at that point. And when Barrick Gold uh, obtained a concession of 82,000 kilometers square in order to uh, do exploration in, in Eastern Congo, it was clear that everything could be at, would, would be available. I mean, these, these, these sites were becoming accessible. And that's how the, the, the conflict uh, started. There were also companies like M. Axon, London, First Quantum Minerals, represented by Joe Clark, former Prime Minister of Canada, Kim Ross, Van Roo, Heritage Oil, Mindev, and others. I, I could quote here cases and cases and cases and cases, but it's not the point. When we understand that there's a whole lot of problem in Latin South America, in Africa, in Asia, in Eastern Europe, and that all of these cases uh, unfortunately look alike. We have to wonder why Canada, this is a paradox I would like to raise here, why Canada is being the home of the majority of these mining companies. Canada welcomes 75% of the world mining companies. If we name randomly a mining corporation in the world, we have three chances out of four that this company is Canadian. 60% uh, of those corporations that go public do it in Toronto. And approximately 90% of the financial transactions that uh, concern the mining uh, sector are done in Toronto also. So the question is, how come this model of democracy that we are, are we supposed to be, uh, why does it welcome this industry that has a so bad track record. Uh, one thing we can do, and this is the hypothesis of uh, the book William Sasha and myself done in Pearl Canada Inc., is to say that Canada is the haven of the world mining industries, a legal and a tax haven, as we put it when we talk about Switzerland, the Bahamas, or Liberia. And I would like just to try to quickly define what we can consider being a haven. I mean, we know that there are a lot of these so-called tax havens, havens and secrecy states in the world. We, we can say that there are like 80, about 80, of them, 80, 80 of them. It's because they don't provide the same services and expertise. I mean, tax havens are a bit like uh, stores in a mall I mean, they all have their domain of expertise. I mean, if, uh, if players in the insurance field want to circumvent the rules in the insurance domain with respect to the way we manage the financial capital we have and the, the, the type of uh, contracts we can uh, shape, well, the Bermudas and the German capital Island are shaped to welcome these companies so that they can operate without any kind of constraints, legal constraints or fiscal constraints. For uh, businessmen operating in the maritime transport and want to register boats that won't have to uh, recognize any law in the environmental field or any law with respect to labor or any taxes 
uh, well legal in the in the Liberia, in Panama, in all kind of events, uh, the free port that are shaped to welcome this particular industry. People own uh, property rights, intellectual property rights, will go to Ireland because in Ireland it is made to uh, allow these players to uh, get access to their income without any taxation. Uh, if um, uh, the financial players wish to create an edge fund, they'll go in the Cayman Islands because the Cayman Islands welcome this specific industry. And when investors want to create a mining corporation, they go to Canada. Because Canada was shaped to support this industry and to allow this industry to circumvent any kind of constraint they can find elsewhere. And Canada works exactly like a tax agency in a way that investors uh, from Australia, Sweden, Israel, Belgium, France, the US, come here, register a company in order to exploit mining concessions that aren't here at all, but that are also abroad. It can be, as I put it, in Argentina, in Chile, in Ecuador, in Colombia, in Tanzania, in, in uh, Papua New Guinea, and so on. And there are also some entities that you create, can create here, like uh, these income trusts, that aren't taxable if the assets of the entity are held abroad. So on and so forth. So Canada was shaped exactly as a haven, a legal and tax haven to allow these specific investors in this specific field to get advantage of a jurisdiction in order to circumvent every kind of constraint they could find elsewhere. And if we want to understand how it works, I would say that there are six, six specific points that allow us to describe Canada as this haven of the world mining industry. And I have to mention them quite quickly because the time is running and I would like to talk about this institute you, you have here in Vancouver. Um, first thing, I will just mention them quickly. And, uh, essentially, the book Imperial Canada Inc. that we wrote with the Sector and I uh, this, developed on each of these six points. First thing, and these points have to be taken all together. This is how we describe this, this jurisdiction. The first point is that it's easier here than elsewhere in the world to promote the wealthiness of a mine uh, uh, to the speculators, to the stock market. I mean, if a Belgian corporation is registered in Toronto and has a copper mine in the Congo, it can claim that this copper mine has, uh, is an important promise uh, to the investors, that is, it has a lot of, of wealth, because here we can mention not only the reserve of a mine, which is what we effectively expect to, to ex extract, but also the resources, so everything a mine may contain. And it gives the idea that if the, the value of, of, of a specific mineral raise on the stock market, or if the technology evolves in a specific way, it will be, it's possible that the, the mine will, will worth more than what it is said as uh, with respect to the, the reserve. It's a bit technical, but it's a, a, an important an important aspect of the way I mean the the, 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 the the structure that is meant to supervise and control the, the mining sector is weaker than elsewhere, and it's also weaker in uh, the effective tools we have in Ontario and in Canada to. Uh, to uh, punish, let's say, uh, authors of fraud. Uh, even though there are some rules in Toronto, it is known that uh, it is uh, quite rare that the Ontario Security Commission really uh, uh, punish some fraudulent actors. Uh, recently, the, the OSC, the Ontario Security Commission, said that it would, for now, often uh, settle with fraudulent actors without any accusation. Just saying, well, we saw that you were, uh, let's say, involved in, in an insider trading, and we won't accuse you formally, it won't be on any record, but just give us a bit of money and we'll, 
we will we will do as if it was it didn't happen. And it's as weak as what we find in tax havens. And Claude Lamoureux, which was the, the, the director of this very important pension plan, which is teachers, once said that Ontario was a paradise for criminal uh, finance criminality. The second aspect is more important. It's about the, the way Canada strongly supports the financial investment in the stock market on the uh, on, on stocks related specifically to the mining sector. There are in this country incentives to support the investment that pension plans, insurance companies, bank, and all kind of investors will make specifically in the mining sector. We can say that this mine, this, this uh, financial speculation in this country is subsidized by the state. The state, with one program that I can mention, the full true share, supports with the taxpayer money the investments made in the uh, mining sector on the stock market. And that's why so many companies are registered here, although the operation aren't, the, the, don't uh, occur here. They do it because they can have access here to easy money, to a lot of liquidity. So in, uh, for instance, a movie of filmmaker Thierry Michel entitled Katanga Business, we see a Belgian engineer saying, well, we created our company in Canada, although we come from Belgium and we exploit copper in the Congo, because we have access in Canada to speculative capital, and that's how we finance our project. Uh, regardless of the uh, controversial character of the, of the, of the project. Um, and the problem related to that is that this money that is put in the hands of the mining companies is not only the money of the insurance companies, of the pension plans, of all kind of investors, it's our money. It's the earning of Canadians that is basically given to the mining industry. And we are here in this room, and I'm indirectly all investors in the mining sectors, because everything is done here to support the investment in the mining sector. So the third point is about the support our diplomacy gives to these industries. The Belgian industry will register in Toronto in order to exploit mines in the Congo because it may claim that the mine is very, very wealthy, so it helps the stock, the price of the stock to raise. There's a lot of money coming in because the investments are supported by the government and subsidized. And when we take the, this money and go to the country and work on the mine, if it goes bad, if there are problems, you'll have the the Canadian diplomacy that will support the, the, the corporation is part of the deal. It would put under pressure the government to expropriate citizens if they are in the concessions that the, uh, the company just acquired. It will put under pressure the local governments so that they vote for a mining codes that look like the one we have in Canada, which are colonial mining codes. Uh, they will put under pressure the government so they give access to water, to electricity, so that they, 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 they build roads or give access to the resources without any problem. And well, in fact, our diplomatic system is sort of an unofficial mining lobby worldwide. And we saw that in the case of the Sutton mining in Tanzania, or in several cases in, in, in South America. If you saw the, 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 the documentary of Martin Fricon about the, 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 the very old case in Chile and Argentina, you may saw this Canadian diplomat uh, struggling hard to support the, the project of the Canadian mining company uh, without being aware of the, the uh, strong resistance that occurred in that country uh, in front of that project. The fourth point is about our legal system. 
It's almost impossible here to sue a corporation where it does a fraud. <laughs> so the corporation that comes here, sells its stocks at a good price, has a lot of money, takes this money, go to Congo, do whatever it wants, because there's no control there, and uh, has the support of the, uh, the Canadian diplomacy. Once it goes very bad, and once some organization talk about what's happening, or filmmakers talk about what's happening, and that there's uh, an awareness here, so that people want to uh, sue that corporation for what it does, it is impossible. There's only one exception, it's the help pay company, there's a trial going on, it's the first time it happens, let's hope that it's something that will be repeated, but since today, the, uh, the civil court will say, we don't, um, we don't, we're not responsible for what is happening abroad, so go to Congo and try to have reparation, go to Chile and try to have reparation, although in, this, in these countries, whether there are no uh, legal system allowing people to, uh, to have uh, access to justice, or sometimes it's the protestants, the demonstrators themselves that are sued for sedition or all kind of silly accusation, uh, and they have to defend themselves because they, they are trying to, to stop some, some mining projects. And the, um, the Oxford Pro Bono Public who wrote uh, a report saying that it's, uh, it's abnormally difficult in Canada to have, uh, to, to have access to, to courts, to courtrooms uh, in that kind of, of topic. Uh, we can also talk about the general way Canada uh, claimed to control and supervise this particular industrial sector, although it covers it. Uh, the OECD recently uh, produced a report, and when we talk about the OECD, it's not, I mean, a bunch of communists we're talking about in this organization about I mean, industrial countries. They produced a document saying that it wasn't uh, understandable that Canada, since 10 years, didn't sue any corporation uh, registered uh, in the country for cases of corruption uh, occurring abroad, although 75% of the world mining companies are registered here, and was said by the OECD, and the OECD was understanding at that point that Canada uh, claimed to uh, control an industry that is it covers, actually, it covers. So if you go to Canada, you know that you won't be disturbed on the legal perspective, uh, because here it's sort of a, a shell, a legal shell uh, for what's happening abroad. And it, it wouldn't be possible in the US, because in the US you at least have the, the Alien Tort Claims Act, and some laws like the the Southern Act or the Congo Act that allows at least people that are very determined to <coughs> sue corporations for what they do abroad. We don't have this, this possibility here. And if, if uh, citizens wish to try to sue a corporation on the criminal level, they have to have the personal uh, uh, authorization of the Federal Minister of Justice. Um, for the last point, I'll, I'll go quickly. The fourth, fourth, uh, the fifth point is about the fact, and I will talk about it when, when we'll see if, if you're the editor, the documentary on, on the, the law issue. But we can summarize the, the five, fifth point saying that if it's difficult for the citizen to sue corporations for what they do abroad, it's very easy for corporations to sue citizens when they criticize them. I was publicly, personally sued for $11 million because I wrote that book about Canada. Uh, and as I put it, it's a book saying that well, there's a lot of allegations worldwide about cases of abuse related to Canadian mining companies and that we should uh, 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 create an inquiry commission here to, to know uh, what happened in all those cases. But it was already too much, and so it's possible for corporations in our legal system to sue citizens uh, using the legal system as a tool against people that don't have the means to have to defend themselves 
in this particular uh, context. Um, and well, a few professor of law explained that in our hierarchy of rights, it's uh, the, 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 the notion of reputation comes before the notion of uh, expression. So here, it's possible for a company even to, to sue for defamation people that try to raise awareness about problems that are related to the public interest because of this notion of reputation. It's, in the US, it's not possible because freedom of speech is a notion registered and inscribed in the Constitution. And the, the sixth point is, I will talk about it very quickly, but it's about the fact that a Canadian, the Canadian government gave itself the mandate to explain to Canadians how the mining corporations are good for the humanity. And the mining lobby is also very uh, proactive in this, uh, in this field. I mean, we quote in Imperial Canada Inc. this program in the elementary schools in Ontario supporting uh, the creation of uh, uh, pieces of art from children celebrating the role of the Canadian mining companies in the global south. So uh, children were invited to uh, write poems or to draw pictures or uh, to, to, to painting about this uh, fabulous role we have to uh, develop the global south and the children that uh, won this sort of competition throughout the province could at the end win real barrack gold stocks. <laughs> um, I have to do, just to conclude about the, the specific role the uh, Canadian International Institute for Exploited Industries and Developing may play in that context. Well, first of all, I mean, when we see the way this institution presents its mandate, we see that it's all about governance, not about democracy, not about justice, not about peace, not about like, mutual respect, but about that bizarre word of governance that didn't exist a few decades ago, that didn't exist at all. It's a word that pop up in our vocabulary and that is nowadays absolutely central even though it doesn't belong to, I would say, our philosophical and cultural tradition. And what is that word, exactly? It's not really a notion, but it's, well, in fact, it's a, it's a concept that comes from the theory of private organizations, and it was developed in the 50s and 60s in order to manage the relationships uh, between actors that had powers, power, in the private organization. And in the 70s, Margaret Thatcher used that word in the political domain and made it a political concept. And afterward, the World Bank used it in order to shape the southern jurisdictions so that their legal and fiscal structures uh, satisfy the world in the, the, the uh, foreign industry. And the governance, what does it, does it mean? It means that it will help sovereign countries to shape their jurisdiction in order to attract foreign capital. And they, we put them responsible of that. And the, 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 the previous programs of structural adjustment of the IMF were meant to help the countries, and we know that it was a disaster, but afterward, the govern, governance program was a way to uh, put the responsibility on sovereign countries, saying, well, ha have low tax or no tax, no duty fees, no constraints at all, so you'll attract the capital. And if you fight against corruption, it will be less fees for the corporations, and so you'll attract them. Uh, even more. But at the end, there are no advantages whatsoever for the population. And I say that having done a book that is, isn't translated on the topic called governance, uh, the totalitarian management. And uh, it's about uh, these texts that we have to study quite closely uh, when they're, especially the one of the World 
back. And what this institute is about, it's about public funding. The Department of Foreign Affairs of Canada will support with millions, almost 25 millions, foreign countries, sovereign countries, to help them to supervise and control the local mining companies. And I would say, well, why do we have to take Canadian taxpayers' money to help countries in the South to, they don't see supervise, they see manage the local mining companies. If it is true, as they claim, that the mining companies are paying taxes and are allowing the state to finance public institutions, why should we here in that room finance this program? The second question we can raise is about the pretensions of the program. The, 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 the institute claimed that extractive, I'm quoting, extractive industries can provide quality jobs. Maybe it's true, but for whom? Usually the jobs that are uh, qualified jobs uh, are given to expatriates, to foreigners that go in the countries and work a bit to, to, to manage the, 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 the mining. It's short-term contracts and low wages job, usually for people that are living in the country. The, the institute will claim that the mining companies generate significant government revenue. It's interesting, interesting to insist on that verb, generate. Generate doesn't mean that companies will pay taxes. It means that they will hire people that will themselves pay taxes. Like if, you, if we see what the mining law in Quebec last year released, it was a press release saying that the, the industry generated in Quebec a thousand, a, a billion and three hundred million dollars in taxes. Well, when we see that the numbers, we see that they put in this amount the, the taxes that the employees of the mining sector pay. They, they take this money, as we know, and they give it to the government, and they say, well, we generated that money. And when we look at it, we see that employees of mining companies pay three times the tax amount that, that company pays. So this is what we have to understand when we talk about generating revenue. Uh, I think it's time is, is running out. I, 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 I could quote the last aspect of the project, which is the environmental issue. We don't talk about that. We don't talk about environmental problem. We don't talk about health problem. We don't talk also about the possibility that should be given to the population to sue the corporations. We only talk about a small kind of problem that can occur with respect to local mining corporations. We say in that, that in these documents that the Canadian government will support with Canadian taxpayers' money programs to help to help local government to manage the mining sector of their own local mining companies. But what we don't say is that their own local mining companies are subsidiaries from Canadian mining companies controlled here, and we don't say that the problem should be raised here, because the problem is here, it's here that we don't control and supervise this sector. And so the, the, what is said is that we will export the way we didn't control and supervise this industrial sector in southern country, um, and uh, will help uh, these countries as if they needed that help. To, uh, for instance, uh, provide researches on treatment for drinking water and water waste, as we uh, as we know that exploiting different kind of ore, especially gold, requires a lot of water, and we will be the one who pay for these researches. And it's almost almost the same thing. We do as if we're supporting the the local and the southern populations 
although we're in reality providing a framework to the mining industry is to allow it to continue to have access to natural resources as they wish it to be with low tax, no constraints, uh, and uh, uh, the possibility to externalize as much as possible the cost of the exploitation. Uh, it's last word on, you know, before discussing, discussing um, this idea of helping developing countries with technical and human resource capacity, as it is said, in um, is clearly a neo-colonialist attitude. It is clearly a way to say we will have, we will support the companies that come from our land and go to yours, and we will help you to uh, s uh, structure the jurisdiction <coughs> you're in in order to facilitate the operation of this of these industries, and I think we should consider it as a disgrace. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Deneau. Can, can everyone hear me if I just speak without a microphone? Yes. Yeah? Okay. So, We've got a little time. We're going to start the film uh, Silence is Gold at 2 o'clock. So we've got about an hour right now. Um, I think that there will probably a lot of, be a lot of questions. We might want to leave 10 or 15 minutes before the film. So let's go for the next 45 minutes or so. Uh, with with Q&A, we can take a break. Uh, those who need to leave, leave whenever you, you need to. But uh, uh, it would be great if we could have this a little bit more also as a discussion. Um, so, uh, come on down to the front uh, if, if you can, or if you, if, you, if you want to, especially if you want to engage uh, and ask some questions or make some points. Uh, if you don't have a loud, booming voice or don't feel like speaking very loudly, um, when you ask a question or make a point, we do have a microphone up here uh, that can be used. It's on a cord, so you'll have to, have to come down here. Um, but um, uh, I, I would say, Please make points, engage critically with what he said. Um, let's try to keep our, um, our, our points maybe down to a couple of minutes, uh, but do give some background to your questions if, if it's a little bit more nuanced of a question as well. Uh, so, Dr. Dow, I, I think I'll let you uh, uh, select, uh, select questions and, and let's have this as a discussion. So, if, if you do want to come down here, um, maybe go ahead and do that right now. Good talk. Very, very interesting. Uh, especially that, that picture you offered of uh, essentially of globalization as a dividing the world up of, of various kind of havens, as though every industry has its haven somewhere and the whole world's been chopping and, and, and divided that way. That's kind of a fascinating way of thinking about <coughs> that aspect of globalization. But that, that's just a that's just an observation. I appreciate putting that picture in my head. Um, the other comment or question I have relates to um, your discussion of that word governance, which I found very, very interesting. Uh, and essentially, as you track that word moving from the private corporate sphere into what we now seem to be calling governance, our, our government, our supposed self-government, uh, really you get another, another picture of, of ultimately the, the state being remade as a tool for the market, for capitalism. So my question would be, and this would maybe relate to the Institute in part, uh, do you still see the state as a, a ground in which we can struggle? And, and can we pull it back from capital? And, what, and, and is something like this Institute a place where we can intervene that way? Um, or do you hold fairly little hope for the state as a as to something we can still contest and therefore do, capital has it, do we need to go somewhere else to actually work against capital? Well, 
I, I would say I'm, I'm, I'm not saying it in the U.S. point of view. You, 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 you understand, but I, I'm a Republican <laughs> in, in a philosophical manner, in a philosophical way. Uh, Canada is not a republic. Canada was, in, in a lot of aspects, remains a colony. And we, as the middle class, are descendant of settlers that were the employees of colonial monopolies. And we, we see all these the cities of these countries as being the work of colonial forces, of colonial uh, players in the short-term history that is ours. I mean, when we go in a, a British city or when we go in a French city in Toulouse or in Bordeaux, we, we, don't, we, we don't know why those cities were built. I mean, it's so far in history. But here, we can say, well, for Kamloops, I know why it was built. Rwanda, I know that it's the corporation that did those cities because their disease were meant to welcome settlers that were there to do the job of the colonialists. And uh, we have the impression that industries see the cities of this country as their property. I mean, why wouldn't they undo what they did? And they see themselves as being uh, the origin of these cities. In a republic, it's not possible to think so. Because in a republic, we consider that the government reflects the willingness of people in a sovereign manner. Uh, in a colony, we're more like managed. And that's why the politics, while well, the approach of governance works so easily here. Because governance is precisely what Canada is. A country where the, we have the impression to manage sort of a business. And in a business, well, employees have rights, but they don't vote for their shareholders. They don't vote for the direction. They are just managed as employees. And Canada is sort of a big business, historically. It was a dominion. And a dominion, it's a bit, I often say that Canada is the Congo of Leopold II uh, in a successful manner. I mean, we, we, historically, it is what we have. It, it is what we are. So, if there was here a republic, or republics, I don't know, uh, we could consider the public institutions as being uh, the result of the public willingness. But it is not at all the case. The last couple of weeks, we heard about uh, the last couple of weeks, or maybe uh, sooner, we heard about uh, coal corp mining, uh, which uh, I did some research, and they do have some really human rights violation in Guatemala, um, and uh, they have uh, given half a million dollars to UBC for some, some stuff. And uh, of course, uh, UBC, even the student paper, they did not uh, gave the news, the UBC student paper. Uh, I was, I once used to write for them a few articles. And uh, they mentioned this without saying a word about human rights violation by uh, Gold Coffee, I believe it's also a Vancouver based uh, company. And uh, I think the students should have more to say. They should be really watchful about these issues because there's enough information about these cases. Uh, I, I heard your comment that people are scared about being sued, but I mean, they won't go far to sue students because as students, there's not much money for them to gain. Uh, so, so my my point is uh, the fact that Gold Corp pays half a million, and if you look at their web page 
and other information. The salary of their CEOs is about 100 million. That's just the part that was public. And giving half a million to UBC by name for yourself, and nobody says a word about human rights violation. Uh, I I am out of words to what to say. And, and as an ex UBC student, I am I'm really embarrassed. This is all I want to say. Just one correction: it's five million dollars that Goldberg was given to Earth and Ocean Sciences here at UBC. And ten million that's a few. Ten million for that's a few. No. It's half a million. <clears throat> No, it's just a recent um, donation and for, one? Uh, yeah, it's uh, $500,000 for scholarships. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> when we see the way uh, the debt, the public debt is rising, we understand that nowadays countries borrow money to financial institutions they don't tax anymore. It's a general problem that occurs also in small institutions such as universities. It's, it's the, and the, what we see appearing or disappearing is democracy. I mean, we're not in a democracy at all. It's not, the democracy is in strength, it doesn't exist. I mean, we're in a, clearly in an oligarchy. And the oligarchy is sort of a power managed by major players of three specific spheres, which are the political, financial, and then an industrial field. And well, these are the people who take decisions all together in uh, a synergy, uh, so that they, they behave as if they own that country, because they own it. Uh, and uh, when you see the, the the phenomenon of revolving doors is quite amazing. I mean, when you look at the careers former prime ministers in this country had in the mining industry, it's, uh, it's quite clear that the, the, the relationships are, 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 are tight. I mean, Joe Clark worked for First Quantum Minerals, Jean Chrétien worked for tens of companies in the energy business, in mining companies. In Congo, uh, as you uh, Brian Mulroney was uh, part of the uh, uh, um, uh, uh, Council of Barry Gold with uh, Peter Monk and uh, uh, George Bush Sr. and uh, Carl Popper from the German Central Bank. And, well, and we see like, all these, I mean, political players before or after their political careers working in or for the mining industry as it occurred in the 19th century in the railroad corporations where I mean, the officials taking decisions in the public institutions were shareholders of the company and that's how Canada was built. We don't talk about it in our mythology but this is our, our, our history. So what we see is how much work has to be done because historically the structure of our political heritage is meant to support industries that feel themselves at home in a colony when they can do whatever they want because there is this country belong to them and as a lot of companies, Canada became easily attacked in the, in the framework of the globalization. And the globalization actually is an officialization of countries. It's, it's a way we put countries in competition, the one, one with each other, uh, in order to uh, uh, facilitate the arbitrage on the advantage of investors becoming sovereign. And in, in last word on this, in, a, in that uh, global context, we could see that, um, of course, uh, well, uh, uh, representatives represent of state, chief of state, uh, presidents or prime ministers are becoming traders that sell jurisdiction advantages to investors that became sovereign. I have one quick point of information on this, too, that students did organize uh, both campuses, I think, about the original core, core crop donations, so we asked a few. And they weren't sued, but students at SFU did receive a letter from the Gold Corps lawyers threatening them with the suit if they didn't take their website down 
you know, try and gather back all the leaflets so people can read them. Yeah. Except it's a chill effect which works very well. Yeah, uh, my concern is the, uh, the direction of the institute. Because I came here hoping to get your sort of views on, say, uh, what you know about the institute. So, for example, what do you know of the people who are involved with the institute? And, and you know, what is your view of how you should be Well, it's. Uh, uh, I won't mention name because I didn't study deeply. Uh, it's an aspect uh, I, I work on a, I mean, wide perspective. And this institute is an aspect among a lot of others. But what is clear when we see the board, the partners, and it's that everybody is involved. So we usually do have, and in the, in the governance theory, we know that there's a, a premise saying that inequality is is okay. We have to deal with inequalities. And in the, 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 the context of governance, unequal partners deal with each other to manage a consensus uh, from the point of view of their inequality. So you have people working uh, on environmental issues, people working on First Nation rights, working on social justice that are dealing with uh, uh, mining corporations in that whole structure, which is this institution. And they are unequal partners searching for a compromise that will be, of course, an unequal compromise. And, and okay, so what do what you, I mean, you talked a lot about challenges, and, and so what do you feel is the, uh, the solution, I guess? So what can the institute I think University do to help prepare, say, some of the, the younger generations who well, need to change? I think that this institution should just disappear. <laughs> I mean, if, if investors from Saudi Arabia came here in Vancouver and said, our government will give support to your local administration to uh, control us, how would we feel? I mean, it's, it's so clearly imperialistic and neo-colonialist to say we'll provide the expertise to help you to uh, uh, supervise our subsidiaries that have access to your resources in the way it had been since decades. So no, it's, it's clearly, as, uh, as uh, Albert Memmi said in his post-colonial and anti-colonial writings, it's clearly, at best, uh, a, a left-wing colonialist project. Uh, <laughs> but it, it may be worse. Hi, um, thank you for your talk. Uh, I would just like to ask you two questions. Uh, you have mentioned that there are hundreds of examples of uh, human rights abuses just briefly mention what are the most outrageous ones in your opinion? And the second question is, how do, I, do you analyze the implications of the hot in the United States, which is um, Well, Congo for me is the most important case because you have several Canadian corporations that were mentioned in a lot of reports, including UN reports, saying that they had a role to play in a war that made 5 million deaths. A war that was related to the control of the mining concessions. And these companies were at least commercial partners of, of uh, actors, players, fighting on the field uh, uh, to control these concessions, to be the the, the local intermediaries, the partners of these interests. And we know what it happened, what it meant for people. It's, uh, it's child soldiers, it's massive rapes, it's a I violent mean, situation that we can even imagine. And we don't talk about it. It's incredible. I mean, it's, and, and there should be a public inquiry just on that specific responsibility we have. Uh, and uh, as far as the Hubby case is concerned, I, uh, I, I, I read about it, but I can't recall exactly 
wouldn't like to see things that are not accurate, so I, I won't comment this case, but it's cases related to abuses in Guatemala, and the Guatemalan were obtained from the Superior Court in Ontario that the, the question is, would be analyzed in the province. So going back to the institute, um, I think as nice as it is to say that, oh, we wish this institute would just go away, I don't think it's going to go away, and I think it's kind of unrealistic to be approaching it that way. So given that, is there some way that we could be pushing for this institute to do something positive, and what would that be? I, to be honest, I don't think so. And to be honest, I think that the government which managed and created that institute is part of the problem. Uh, I mean, the, the problem is that we have a government a, which is submit to the industry, which exists to allow the industry to operate. Uh, so it's a service that the government gives to the industry. And it's so clear that everything was written in order to satisfy the interests of the mining corporation. We could imagine an institute, an institute but, it would have, but it wouldn't be that one. And it would be an institute, for instance, on the ways, uh, well, as any institution, it should be an institution related to, uh, public, to, uh, to public good, to the, the, the the public interest and not to a specific interest. Government should exist to be over all kind of interests and not to be partners of specific interests. And we all always do in this ideology as if everybody could cooperate on this and have a win-win situation. But there are a lot of situations where there are no win-win situations. For instance, gold. As soon as you dig for gold, you will have people that will lose. We will lose water, we will lose land, we will lose security, we will lose a lot of things. They won't win anything, even though on paper you'll say that they, uh, we created a bit of jobs, we, did, uh, we, we, we sent uh, Mustafa to a school, uh, we uh, helped, uh, I don't know, that community to have a school, or I don't know what. Uh, me, if you dig for gold, you'll destroy the, the land of the community, which is huge. as. Uh, uh, an impact. And uh, the sort of question will never be raised in that institute. And I, I, I think that there are situations in, in the history where the population can be against. I mean, we should always try to cooperate with people that um, don't wish to cooperate but wish to manipulate. Um, I, I think by its very structure, there's a lot of problems with the institute, like, for, first of all, the fact, oh, uh, <coughs> uh, I, I, I think by its very structure, there's a lot of problems with the institute, like the fact that it was, um, that it was funded by um, CETA, which is now part of the Department of Foreign Affairs, has a history of promoting um, mining interests, like you said, um, the fact that, um, Mining Watch Canada recently re released a report uh, describing um, some of the structural problems, like the fact that it will operate in areas with high Canadian investment. That's in the uh, contribution agreement. Um, the fact that it has strategic partners with, uh, with a lot of these companies, including Gold Corp. Um, the fact that it has to ask CETA for permission before communicating to the public. Um, so uh, I just um, so, just those those are some of the the problems I see. Um, if you'd like to talk about this more, I'd suggest you come to um, the social justice center. We have meetings on Tuesdays at five um, upstairs in the sub. Um, but I just wanted to ask uh, specifically about um, the role of academia in uh, in and how it uh, relates to these uh, to the mining industry. It's just interesting to see that. Well, I'm, I'm mainly working on taxing. This, this is my field, and well, Canada is one of them with respect to the mining sector, and that's why I was interested in mining. Well, the, the problem with taxing is that you, you have, or like 
Canada is one of the mineral states or a free zone for the mining sector historically, and then it became a haven for the foreign companies that wanted to have access to a, uh, advantageous jurisdiction to exploit mines as we did it historically here. I mean, we just exploited our, uh, exported our model, our colonial model, uh, in the last decades. This is the only thing we did in the framework of the globalization. And what the problem is, you have this country, it started here, uh, corporations that pay almost no royalty or no royalty at all on what they dig, uh, they take, the part they take, they extract. Uh, you have a public support to the creation of jobs, to the, the, the programs related to uh, development and research. Uh, you have this whole territory that is built with public money for the industry, roads, water, electricity. I mean, we provide them uh, all they need to, to, on a private basis, to exploit the, the territory and make private incomes out of, out of it. And, well, the, uh, the skills of the, the employees of, the, of these corporations is part of the deal. We'll take public money to finance institutions that will uh, form and educate uh, a certain type of people that will be able to work for you and you won't have to pay for that. And the people who pay at the end are the employees themselves, even though they already paid to have their, 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 their formation, their diploma, their degree. So, so we're always in the situation where it, 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 that is a, a, a oligarchy, where everything is done to uh, allow the value to be registered by the players that are uh, on the top of the pyramid. Uh, and People that are under are seeing what they produce as value being uh, uh, held by those who uh, dominate. Uh, to 
develop technologies they control. And in a way that they are uh, controlling the situation and not say, well, we have to uh, put an end to that type of work because children as who are working is dangerous and so on, they go in, in, in holes and they sometimes they die. And so on. We, we know it's very dangerous. In it. But uh, to uh, give a concession to a Western company that will arrive with its instruments and tools and means that no sovereign country can compete with is not a solution. And it is often in that direction that we go. We talked a lot about America. So when, when I hear you speak, it's like an everyday life pays back home. So yeah, I can see completely that same as Peru, rivers all the way in toxic, not drinkable at all. You can see the first company that comes to my mind is Anglo Anglo Bolashante Interest. They even sponsor soccer teams back home. So my question is, I mean, what's the supervision? What's the role of responsibility of Canada in this project? In this specific project? No. That's okay. the first company. Yeah, there's a bunch of other companies. In the previous legislation in Ottawa, the Conservative government was a minority in the, the House of Commons. And the three oppositions had projects that showed that it is possible in this country to control a bit more the mining companies. It's not a, a, a utopia. Uh, the NDP had that project allowing citizens to sue a corporation for what it does abroad. The Liberals had this C300 projects that was defeated, although the Conservatives were a minority in the room, saying that the Canadian government shouldn't invest in a corporation that is uh, allegedly uh, implicated in cases of abuse. And the Bloc Québécois had a project saying that there should be a permanent inquiry commission on the mining corporations that would have the power to freeze the assets of some corporations when it's clear that they are involved in some cases of abuse. Well, it's possible, and it's not something I'm you know, just imagining. It was written in bills that we can still read today. So we see that there's, there are ways to control this industry, but the liberal project of uh, MP John McKay, which, is the we which was the weakest of all three, was defeated because the lobby, the lobby was intense before the vote that the liberals didn't show up in the room. And Michael Ignacev, which was the leader of the liberals, himself didn't show up, saying explicitly that he didn't believe in the project of his own MP. And what I found surprising is usually when you have those kind of you know, diversions in a, in a party, it will make a story. We will do like, if we don't want it, we will do it. And we, because journalists understand that kind of topic. They, they go, they like that. But not that time. We did as if it was normal that the, the leader of a party would disappear when one of his own MP proposed something. Oh. And in the, the scientist's goal, the, the documentary of Julien Fréchette, we see uh, uh, the, 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 there's a, a part of the movie dedicated to that story. Uh, I don't think I need a microphone, I'm pretty loud. Um, my question is about military. I don't know if everybody knows Canada just got a brand new shiny military spy center and it's everybody as good as the NSA. Uh, last fall there was some documents leaked that we were spying on Brazil. Uh, some of my friends got a discussion, like, why? Brazil's not a threat. Why does their military need to spy on you? It turns out that they were looking into protests, blockades, that sort of action groups on the ground. Now, I don't know if we were actually sending any troops, but I think we were at least sending information. <coughs> so I'm wondering if you know about the ties between Canada's military and these mining operations all over the world. On, on the brothers. If you're able to want to talk about it, <laughs> I don't believe you, if you don't. 
Well, on a broader scale, there's a lot of um, uh, operations useful for the mining industry that are financed by the government. For instance, there are ways with satellites to do mining exploration, and all this program is financed by the government. And what we see is that without, we, we talk all, always about the state being too important, uh, and we are sort of in a socialist state, and the state is too fat, and we should. But actually, the mining corporations need the public spending to, to be profitable. Because there are so much money invested in all kinds of programs that the mining corporation would be uh, allowed to finance. Um, well, and it's just that what you raised uh, as an issue is just one of the uh, many examples we find about the retired relations between the state. And the, but the, uh, the army, as such, I wouldn't say I wouldn't insist on that topic. To answer your question, I wouldn't insist because. Canada is not really an imperialistic state. I don't uh, define him as such. I mean, the USA are imperialistic. France is. The UK is historically. Uh, but Canada, not really. Canada is more like a haven. It's, it's a difference. But what, what's the difference between an imperialistic state and a haven? A haven is guilty of passivity. A haven says, come home. You won't have any problem. You won't be sued. Uh, will just uh, allow uh, 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 give incentives to uh, to uh, investors so that they put their money in your sector. Uh, you won't have any tax to pay, and, and so on and so forth, so that you can do whatever you want abroad. The only way I would say that Canada is imperialistic is throughout its diplomatic missions and the system. But usually, I mean. Canada don't send soldiers abroad to support the mining industry, but they will let the companies to hire mercenaries. And they, the companies that do so won't be sued here. And there, there's a, a, a national instrument called, I know there's, if I can recall, 10152 or something like that. It says that if a corporation, you, you, we can understand the, 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 the principles here and the philosophy of that state with that uh, national instrument. If corporation abroad with its activities provoke social damages, environmental crisis, time tensions between population, all kinds of problems, I mean crime and so on, it has to talk about it and to disclose it publicly in Canada only if it uh, influences the value of the stock. So the law is written in order to support and to protect the investors. But if the value of the stocks remains the same or it isn't influenced by all these consequences, here we don't have to dispose it. And it's, it's the way we can see Canada as a passive country, uh, which makes it a haven. I'm not saying or suggesting that every single Canadian mining company is criminal. But what I do say is that this field is totally out of control. Nobody, con no institution or no entity, public entity, controls really this field, this industrial sector. Um, and, well, um, an initiative that could be done, I will answer your question, but an initiative that could be done is what I always suggested when I do conferences, but nobody never took the idea of that. I'm giving it to you, there's no property rights on that. <laughs> and it's, I would like, we need a bit of money, but not that much. Might be four or five employees for a year to do what I would call a report of reports. And it's, 
the, the, to summarize all what it was written on Canadian mining projects worldwide in a unique document that we could we use after to put under pressure investors and saying, well, in the report of reports, we see that that particular organization mentioned that problem with respect to that company in that country. Well, and also we would have some sort of a document to um, supervise in this um, citizen way the, what the government doesn't do with mean, the, the companies. Um, the problem with this institution is that we don't know who wrote the mandate. I mean, when you start with sort of a mandate, everything is decided. I mean, the, the premises are, are false. It's a neo-colonialist approach. So, an institute that would be a democratic institute would, would be the result of a reflection and a discussion in a democratic manner about what we want this institute to be. We start with an institute with a mandate that is totally uh, upside down, and we say, well, do something with it. Find something in it that you find interesting. Find your way out, and you'll have a bit of money. And if not, you're considered as being uh, unable to, uh, to, to behave in a governance sphere, one sense, so to say. And, well, when, when we see the, the, the way this project is shaped, we see that it was written by people that believe in the industry or that have interest in that industry. But if we want to imagine a, an institute that uh, support, uh, for, for, for instance, I, I think that, I was talking about that with friends previously today, I think that geology shouldn't be a scientific discipline as such. Geology should be integrated to geography. Uh, is there an institute that can support that idea? I don't think that that one will. Geology is a this scientific discipline that is only relevant with respect to industrial exploitation and financial uh, operations with respect to that industry. Uh, because it's a way to isolate elements of the ground. And when a geologist arrives in southern country, people don't understand. Him. Because for people, usually we're more like geographers. What's the difference between a geologist and a geographer? A geographer will see a land as a system. And everything works and belongs all together. It works as a system. But the geologist will see gold, copper, iron, and will isolate this element from the other as being the object of its study. You won't find any, I mean, um, citizen or community in the global south that will think that way. And an institute that would be able to raise that problem and give a voice to people that think that geology is an imperialistic scientific domain would be interesting. But I don't think that we will see that appear in the so. Just to make a point on that, the ruling the other day against the Buffalo River Dene, that the Judge Curry said there is no responsibility to consult for an exploration permit. Right? If it was exploitation, it would be different, but exploration is, it's, there's no problem. Although it's polluting, of course. Problematic. Well, to exploration, not yet, but I mean, you only explore to eventually exploit. But it can be polluting also. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, can, I, can you just um, talk about the role of initiatives to try to change the industry? For example, the Extractive Industries Transparency Initiative. So, any initiatives aimed at transparency, how do, do you see that leading to accountability? Especially when it's predicated mainly on the role of civil society, which as you said, is the least powerful. Um, and so how can that be addressed uh, to hopefully get change? Yeah, it's an initiative that uh, encourage companies to disclose the money they gave to countries so to make sure that the country the money was registered in the public budget. Well it's just a small aspect. I mean the whole problem is our way of life. I mean we consume too much. 
Uh, I mean, it's, I mean it, we shouldn't dig for gold anymore. We have plenty of gold. We shouldn't dig for all those ore. I mean, we build objects that are meant to be uh, to, to to break uh, in a few weeks, so that we dig, then extract, or again to build more uh, objects that will break in uh, in a few weeks and so on. I mean, we don't recycle. A lot. We should recycle a lot more. I mean, the the, the question of the mining uh, operations should be registered in a lot more broader perspective. What do we do with recycling? What do we do with with in French we see of sorry, it's not programming. This is the programming. Why not? Why not? Yeah. So this is the, the problem. We we build things that are meant to be destroyed. I mean. I mean, why can't we, will this institute raise this issue? I mean, it has to be raised as part of the problem. And, that, and the, the, the problem with the, I would say, Western epistemology is that we always isolate the objects. We always isolate the problems. And what I'm trying to do in my work is put the pieces together so that we can have a broader perspective on the problem, so that we can start to think about them. I don't have any solution. I just want the problem, the problems in plural to be addressed all together because they belong all together. How about water pollution? I used to live in Chicago, Chapet in the 60s, and uh, every time they found a new gold claim and a, a copper claim, they just picked the First Nations off, put it in another mine, and they had rivers of gray sludge going through. In 1978, I was in uh, Penn State with my uh, roommate, and he was checking uh, areas that had been mined for coal. And there was some farmer who had their co corn that was two feet high because his neighbor gave him truckloads and truckloads of, of manure. That's the only reason he had corn two feet high. And his uh, aunt had the mineral rights, so she had sold the coal, and the regulations said the before and the after pictures have to be the same. But there was no regulation about having two feet of limestone. And it turns out when you break up all that rock, the sulfides in it turn to sulfuric acid, which destroys almost everything. And they didn't have a little inconvenient regulation about putting two feet of limestone and maybe some clay to stop the release of sulfuric acid. So we are living in an area where there are no rules. You can do everything you want as long as you give a big chunk of coin to the ruling class. And meanwhile, we are given the right to drink polluted water, uh, water with cadmium and other nasty toxic minerals in it. And there was a scientist from Washington State who was upset about what's going on, and he talked to the insurance agents. And the insurance agents put the heat on the government to change the regulations. So if we forced the, if we got the insurance agents to put Right, pressure about uh, the uh, pipeline disasters, where the pipeline companies have been dis disobeying any safety regulations for 50 to 20 years because they have friends in high places. If we actually had people who had done uh, oil recovery from polluted sites and saw how much it cost, if they had if they had to put a, a bond up front. For, for the cleanup of the uranium mine, which is $1 billion up front, if they start having the true cost of all this stuff, then the government would not automatically say you can do anything you want because you gave us a little envelope, which is right now we have the status quo. Yeah, it's interesting, uh, Jacques Fortin, which is uh, an accountant at the uh, Ashes in Montreal, says that government should ask mining companies to uh, make the to, uh, make the promise that the mining sites they are exploiting will be the same after the, the, the industrial process. And, uh, and, 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 and just and let me finish, please. And, and he said the, the condition should be you should find an insurance company that will insure you. And the trick is that no insurance company will ever get involved in such projects, in such promises, because it's not possible. So it's a way to, I mean, to... Regulate. Yeah, to regulate. Alain, yeah. real quick here. Uh, we have uh, about 15 minutes. We're about quarter to two.
Why don't we take a couple more questions and then we'll we'll take a break for a little bit before the film. And, yeah. I'll use the mic. I have kind of a low voice. Um, thank you for your talk. Um, my question is about um, about this mining institute and the mechanisms by which it entices faculty and students to, to come on board with it. Um, and just want to read a short thing here that kind of relates to a, a, one of the previous comments about Gold Corp. Um, this is in their CSR report from 2005. Um, Gold Corp is considering a broad range of philosophical and moral issues such as social justice, human rights, and distribution of wealth while having no specific corporate policies on these issues. They're addressed in part through the company's code of business conduct, etc. Um, Gold Corp also supports financially the Liu Institute for Global Issues, whose research embraces international relations, human security, peace, and disarmament, the environment, conflict, and development, and global health and international justice issues. Um, so right now, I'm a student, PhD student, at the School of Population and Public Health here at UBC. Um, our school has been approached by this institute for partnership. Um, a lot of students have been raising uh, critical questions about it. Uh, over 60 of us have signed uh, a letter of concern uh, to our director. Uh, it's being talked about um, in the in faculty meetings. Um, but a lot of what I'm hearing so far uh, from some students and, and some faculty is something along the lines of, well, we're doing these good projects, uh, you know, working with small miner, with art, artisanal miners or things like that. Uh, and so, uh, so really, if, if I can get the money uh, for it, then, uh, then I think that's fine. Look, I'm, I'm doing this good. We see it in that, that CSR report from uh, Gold Corp. They're, they're clearly co-opting the Lew Institute by giving funding, and then they don't have to deal with human rights issues. They can say they support the Lew. Um, what are your thoughts on that mechanism and how to engage people and bring awareness to that mechanism by which the institute is, is winning over some departments in this university to partnership? Thank you. Well, it is a huge question. I mean, time is running out. I would just raise an aspect these projects are meant to satisfy in a way or another all the kind of different actors so that they only see the, 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 the whole picture from the point of view that, that they, 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 they see as being profitable. And this is a problem with governance. Governance is this thing, well, we are all partners. We are just there to cooperate and we will be friendly with, one, with each other so that we have a small interest or a big interest in the whole I mean, the, the discussion or the, this, this partnership. Um, and I mean, this is the, 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 the project as it is defined to uh, generate that kind of attitude. Uh, but I, I don't know if I'm answering the question. How about we propose that the people in, the, in these third nations get the same kind of salary that we expect? Like, don't the First Nations have the right to make 35 grand a year? Uh, I guess a comment and a question. First, I'm a geologist, and I assure you that it's a science that's well beyond just finding the iron ore. And we study the other formation of the earth. It's, it's a, it would be a disaster, too. But uh -huh. I, there are components that, do, that are part of the mining industry. Yeah, I just, I, I just want to make sure I'm, I'm well understood. I just meant that I don't mean, I don't think that geology. Geology should disappear, but I think it should be part of geography. And uh, well, I think they should work together. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So my, my question was then, um, who do you think is doing it right? Who, who can we look to, to if, if Canada is doing it so wrong? Who, who, do you think we, who can we look to? Anyone? Or are you, are you so really it? It? We don't need it. Well, well yeah, we don't they, need it. Uh, I did it. The problem is that we have a state that does nothing. I mean, it allows corporations to behave as they wish and put pressure on every kind of entity that could provide constraints. Or, uh, and the right questions aren't asked. I mean, 
what kind? Why are we exploiting that these minerals? So is it that important to to exploit uh, gold, for instance, or diamond, or uh, uranium? Uh, the premise, I mean, the question that has to be raised aren't raised at all. It, 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 it's a bit as if they, they couldn't exist. Uh, so, so we're in an ideology here. And the ideology is that we have to dig. Why are we starting from that, that, that point of view? And then we say to people, well, this is the ideology, we have to dig, we have to exploit. It's good for everybody, and if you agree with that, we'll see if we have common interests, and we'll. But it's an hegemony. I mean, it's it's a discourse that doesn't allow a debate. Uh, whether it uh, happens in, in Canada or elsewhere, this kind of censorship, because of it. Uh, with money, with the fact that students want to, uh, I mean, have a, a life and uh, do things, but we are. Stuck in that system, it makes us, if I may speak in the old fashioned way, proletarians. I mean, we don't control at all the, the, the mechanism by which the, the, the society is evolving. We're, 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 yeah. do, you, do you think that like, the states or Australia or Britain are, are they doing it better than us? No, it's just that we, we, we won. <laughs> It's just that the, the, the problem of globalization is it's an offshoreization. I mean, every country tries to attract capital in, in those uh, offshore ways, so they say, with less constraints, less tax, less, less regulation, and the problem is a worldwide problem, and we're facing it nowadays. I guess there's one quick question, and then we'll wrap this up. I some of the comments about what to do and what is to be done in these sorts of things, and I, I kind of agree with the comment over here that we're we're unlikely to get rid of this institute completely. Um, and I agree with LA's sort of response too, which is, and we're also unlikely to get a better institute out of what this thing is. So I think what we're really left with, and but it could lead somewhere else eventually, is that we have to discredit the institute as much as possible and constantly call it into question. Just as, as a place to begin what to do, because the big or, things. Or create alternate voices. Like I went to the Cold Dev Festival and there was these, 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 all these films about people showing how they're being terrorized by paramilitaries, government forces, and all these people are out there tormenting them to death so the land becomes vacant so it can be exploited and they're auctioned off to the highest bidder. The other thing is, if, uh, if, if, excuse me, if I can... A, a, a lead claim and they are tracking all this lead to port, but they didn't bother putting it in containers. So finally, a few years later, when they noticed the, the residents getting sick from lead poisoning in the water, they suddenly said, oh, maybe we should put it in bags. A bag costs $10. It, the, the idea is, let's get the cost of production as low as possible. Let's sell it at a loss to foreign buyers. And let's have no local benefits. And people say, we have to dig. Thank you. Where are the local Thank you. benefits? Thank you for your comments. I'm just going to have to wrap this up. Um, I appreciate that. Let's, let's keep having a discussion. But um, okay. I would like to just, just formally right now um, um, close this event. Thank you, everyone, uh, for coming. Thank you, Dr. Denou. <laughs>